Greetings and welcome to an Element 14 thing, and this is the Fujitsu N860 2500T111, using 3rd generation Fujitsu Leaf Spring switches. Today we're going to modify this keyboard to work with IBM PC compatible machines, so let's go ahead and get started. I've got Leaf Springs of Steel. Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Andy, and if you couldn't tell from the intro, I've got a special piece of hardware to work on today. I got this Fujitsu keyboard from Clint, also known as LGR, and he found this while thrift store shopping. Now, I've got to be honest, this is nicer than any of the keyboards I currently own. It's heavy, solidly built, the key switches are buttery smooth, and the whole thing has a unique and interesting look to it. But there is a problem. I haven't been able to test the Fujitsu due to its unusual 8-pin DIN connection. If anyone watching has the skills to create an adapter, please get in touch. Seriously, I want to use this thing. Of course, as soon as I saw that, I immediately reached out to LGR and he agreed to send me the keyboard so I could make it work with the classic PCs that he likes to demonstrate on his channel. The plan is to make an adapter that converts the 8-pin DIN to a more standard PS2 connector. But that's not all, we also need to convert the communication protocol. And in fact, there's one issue that an adapter can't fix by itself, and that's called single key rollover. Rollover refers to the number of key presses that a keyboard can detect at one time. One key rollover is not good, especially for games. The most common solution for this is to replace the keyboard controller, and that's exactly what we're going to do. A Raspberry Pi Pico should work as a substitute, and at this point in time, it's one of the few microcontrollers I could find that was in stock and affordable. First, we'll write some software for the Pico, that implements the PS2 protocol and sends simulated key presses to the PC. And once we've got that fully working, we'll interface with the actual keyboard by wiring the Pico into the keyboard matrix. All right, there's no point in putting it off any longer. Let's get to work. The first thing we're gonna do is program the Pico to emulate a PS2 keyboard. And we can do pretty much all of our programming in advance before we open up the Fujitsu itself. This device is gonna be the keyboard's new brain and it'll replace the controller chip that's in there now. Now, if I was modding this keyboard to work with modern PCs, I might go with a USB or maybe a Bluetooth interface. But since its purpose is to work with older machines, I think PS2 is more appropriate. PS2 stands for IBM Personal System 2, and it was a standard port type for keyboards and mice for many years. I'm not gonna go into the details of setting up a Pico development environment in Windows because it's a rapidly changing thing. In fact, the installer I used looks like it was moved and sort of absorbed in the official Raspberry Pi GitHub recently. So I'll put a link in the Element 14 community site, which you can find in the description of this video. And if you get stuck, just send me a message over there and I'll be more than happy to help. Just for fun, I decided to ask ChatGPT to write the code for me. It is supposed to be a powerful tool and I figured it would save me some time if it worked, right? Well, it did stop a couple times while generating the code and I had to encourage it to keep going. But believe it or not, it actually produced a very well formatted and convincing bunch of nonsense that didn't work at all. Maybe newer versions will be up to the task, but that'll have to wait for a future video. Which is actually fine, because I was able to find this Arduino library written by humans that required just a little bit of effort to port over to the Pico. And this really came down to replacing some Arduino specific calls with the Pico equivalents. However, this is just a library that doesn't actually do anything without a program to run in. So let's make a simple Arduino-like program file with setup and loop functions, and we'll tell it to type the letter A over and over again. And that should be good for a simple test. The function here is called keyboard make break, which refers to make and break codes. A make is generated when a key is pressed, and a break happens when it's released. You might be wondering why we need separate codes, and the reason becomes important when multiple keys are involved. For example, you could press one key, and then before releasing it, press another key, and finally you release both keys. We need to be able to detect that type of scenario. Uploading the code to the Pico is super easy, as I've shown in my other videos. Uh, you just hold down the button as you plug in the USB cable, and drag the UF2 file into the folder that appears. So we've got our board that emulates a PS2 keyboard uh, that types the letter A forever. Now we need to wire it up. So let's start with the breadboard. PS2 uses a bi-directional serial protocol, but there's only four pins used in a PS2 connector. Clock, data, plus five volts, and ground. Now that means the information is sent in both directions using the same lines. So how does that work? 
Clock and data are both open collector, which means the device and the host only ever pull the lines low, and a pull-up resistor holds the lines high when the bus is idle. Now, most of the time data will be transmitted from the keyboard to the computer, but occasionally the computer will need to send something to the keyboard, such as LED status. In our case, we can just acknowledge and then ignore those messages, because this keyboard doesn't actually have any LEDs. We're using the Pico's internal pull-up resistor, so we don't have to add any external ones here. But we do need level shifters, because the GPIO is 3.3 volts, and the Pico is not 5 volt tolerant. I've got a bi-directional level shifter board here for convenience. We wire our clock and data pins into the lower voltage side, and the PS2 cable will plug into the higher 5 volt side. This is a PS2 extension cable that I've cut in half, and these are breadboard jumper wires that will splice to the wires inside the cable. Now, if you're using an online diagram to map out the pins, make sure the orientation is correct. It's easy to confuse male and female versions of a connector or inside versus outside views when you're looking at a 2D line drawing. I also try to use consistent colors to identify wires quickly. It turns out that I don't have a single device with a PS2 connector in it. I was kind of surprised by that. So for now, I'm going to use this PS2 to USB adapter and basically hope that it complies properly with a spec. So I've got a notepad instance open here to display the incoming key presses. And look at that. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing, actually. I mean, as far as Windows is concerned, that's a keyboard. A practically useless keyboard, but a keyboard nonetheless. Do you like winning free stuff? Are you an electronics hobbyist? Do you like building cool projects and winning prizes for what you build? The Element 14 community presents Project 14, the member-driven destination where you decide on the challenge. You enter projects to win monthly prizes and you vote on the winners. What are you waiting for? Join the Element 14 community so you too can enter one of our contests or submit an idea for your own. Join now! Of course, a keyboard is more than just a circuit board that sends out the letter A for all eternity. It has to respond to physical keys, and for that, we need to wire it up to the matrix. You may have noticed that our keyboard has over 100 keys, but our microcontroller does not have over 100 inputs, and that presents a problem. So we use a matrix, or a sort of grid, where every I.O. pin is either a row or a column, and each key is a cell in the grid. The columns are outputs and the rows are inputs, each with a pull-down resistor enabled. To check if a key is pressed, we set the column pin for that key high, and then check for the presence of a high signal on the row pin. When we want to check the entire keyboard state, we set each column high individually in turn, and for each column we read each row to get the status of the corresponding key. This is called scanning the matrix. Got it. We don't have to build the physical matrix. Those are all the traces that go to the keys on the circuit board but we do have to map them to know what goes where. Fortunately, somebody called old is new at deaththority.net has done the hard work for us. So if this is you, thank you, you're awesome, and you saved me a lot of time. This matrix map was made for a teensy, and you can see references to Arduino pin numbers, but we can ignore that. If we take this back to our code, we can use it to build a large switch statement for the columns with nested switch statements for the rows. Every key on the keyboard has a case statement in here. So column A, row one is numpad eight, column A, row two is F9, and so on, just like it shows in the table. Some of these are empty, so we simply return from the function. And the pause, break, and print screen keys are special cases, so we deal with them separately. This code is full of constants, and those constants refer to GPIO pin numbers. Now, I've already looked ahead to see how the keyboard is laid out and what numbers make sense. We can do a preliminary test and simulate key presses by shorting pins together with jumper wires, uh, just be careful, if you short the wrong pins, you could fry your Pico. This is technically a complete keyboard implementation. It's almost impossible to use, but you could type something with it if you had the patience. Some of the keys are registering multiple times, so we need to add something called debouncing. When a key state change is detected, we check the value over multiple scans until it settles down, and this eliminates unwanted actuations. And finally, there's one more software feature that isn't critical, but it would probably be missed if you're using the keyboard in DOS. It's called Typematic, and it refers to keys that repeat when you hold them down. For example, when I press H, there's a short delay and then a whole bunch of H's appear. Modern versions of Windows implement the repeating behavior in the OS, and they just ignore repeated make codes from the keyboard. But DOS, or at least the version of FreeDOS which I tested, does not. PS2 keyboards have to provide the Typematic feature themselves in that environment. So I created a minimal implementation to save time, and I've chosen what I think are sensible default values for delay and repeat times based on IBM's technical documentation, and hopefully that'll be sufficient. 
Now we get to see what's inside the elusive Fujitsu. I did some research and I discovered that this is actually meant to be used with a medical device called an endoscope, and that's why it has key labels like store patient and recall patient. It's actually kind of interesting. Now this keyboard is in really nice condition, so I'm using this ugly green towel so that I don't scratch the keys. I'm gonna start with these two screws. The back lifts right off and this third screw has a ground wire connected to the metal case. A couple more screws hold the board in and I'm actually gonna tear this down completely in case it needs a deep clean and to get a look at those famous leaf springs. Well, there you have it. This thing is immaculate. On the top is the board with the springs mounted on directly and below are the keys with those little white plungers. When I press a key, the plunger slides smoothly and presses on the spring directly. You'll also notice diodes along each row of the matrix and those are there to prevent an unwanted effect called ghosting. You can see the symbol there indicating the direction of the diodes. At the top of the board is the controller and other logic chips, along with a bunch of passive components that can all be removed. We're gonna install the Pico in this area and we don't want anything interfering with the signals. I'm not gonna get fancy with this, I'm just using some flux, an old soldering iron with some soldering wick, and plenty of patience. Cotton swabs and isopropyl alcohol clean up the board nicely and just look at how neat that is with everything removed. This next part's gonna be tricky. We're gonna wire up some ribbon cables and they have to be flat against the microcontroller, but also long enough to reach the right parts on the keyboard. We need to minimize the height because there's only so much room in here for components. Again, the desk authority site is an invaluable reference for where the wires need to be routed. I was a bit worried that the wires would break off from mechanical stress as I handled them, so I figured out a trick that I could do with hot glue. Stickers and labels have smooth backing paper that hot glue doesn't like to stick to, so you put some glue down, and then the label backing paper and press on it with something flat and the result looks nicer and takes less vertical space than a big ugly blob. Next we wire up the level shifter the same way we did it on the breadboard with the goal of it being flat and streamlined so it fits in the case. Before we install the Pico we'll put down a piece of Kapton tape to insulate it from the bare wires on the board. Finally we wire the data, clock, power, and ground to the keyboard connector. Loop the ends of the wires around and establish a good mechanical connection rather than rely on solder to hold things together. The last thing we need to do is build an adapter to go from the original 8-pin DIN to a regular PS2 keyboard connector. Again, I'm using a PS2 extension cable, and the female DIN connectors can be purchased separately. Be especially careful about wiring this the right way. It's very easy to get things reversed, and you don't want to fry the board now. I am adding liberal amounts of hot glue to the inside of the connector to act as a cheap form of potting. If you know of any alternatives to this approach, feel free to share them in the comments. So what do you think? Is this a working keyboard? There's only one way to find out. You'd never be able to tell just by looking at it that this has been modified, and that's kind of the point. The first thing I'm gonna do is test how well this works on a modern machine. I've got the USB adapter here, so we'll plug that in, and I'll do Windows R, which is actually Graph R now. Cool. All right, we'll open Notepad. The, uh, the right shift key is way over to the right, and I usually end up hitting this blank key instead, but I went ahead and mapped it to right shift as well, so when I accidentally hit it, it does what I want. Also, most keyboards have little raised bumps on the F and J keys so you can find them without looking. The F and J keys are completely smooth, which is a minor annoyance. I don't want to send the keyboard to LGR without first testing it on a computer with a real physical PS2 port. So I bought this HP Thin Client. This is a T5710, and it's supposed to be decent for playing DOS games. I've already installed FreeDOS on here, so let's plug in the Fujitsu. Be aware that PS2 keyboards are not hot swappable, so don't try plugging them in or removing them while the machine is running. So I'll leave the games for LGR to try. I don't want to spoil his fun. Um, instead, I'm going to make a scene for an old graphics program called Pob Ray. Um, this is a good test because you define scenes with a script file rather than like a fancy UI. I'm going to go with a classic 90s like checkered board pattern and floating spheres and all that. Oh uh, yeah, this brings back memories. I love it. That's all we have for today. Have you ever modified a device or peripheral to work with different hardware? Let us know on the Element 14 community at the link in the description, and we'll see you next time.